My name is Norman Wurzba, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar series entitled Facing the Anthropocene. In case you're unfamiliar with this term, the Anthropocene marks the unprecedented moment when some humans became a dominant force in planetary history, responsible for the widespread alteration of the world's land, ocean, atmospheric, and life systems. Though planetary systems and biological processes are still clearly at work, their expressions and effects can no longer be understood apart from human activity. Ranging from the cellular to the atmospheric levels, there is no place or process on Earth that does not reflect humanity's technological prowess and its economic reach. The advent of the Anthropocene thus compels a rethinking of multiple fundamental questions like, what sort of being is the human being that now exerts this outsized power? And to what end should this power be directed? How can we determine when power becomes irresponsible? Can we speak of anything being sacred? And then what sort of world should we endeavor to build together? And what economic, political, and legal mechanisms do we need to get there? How do we exercise hope? It is unlikely that the frames of thought that brought us to this moment especially when confined to any one particular academic discipline, are sufficient to help us imagine and implement a better future, which is why now is the time to commit to a rigorous probing of the assumptions and the commitments that have and continue to inspire our collective life. And we will invite you as webinar participants to join in this questioning. You will see at the bottom of your Zoom screen a Q&A tab and please insert questions there as we will have time to take up those questions later in this webinar. I now want to welcome Suzanne Shanahan, who is director of the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke. And I want to express my gratitude to her for hosting this grant project. So Suzanne. Wonderful. So I am truly delighted and honored uh, to introduce this final webinar in the Facing the Anthropocene series and to have the treat of uh, sharing a little bit more about your host for the series, Norman Wurzba. Uh, for loyal attendees, you will have surmised that Norman is the intellectual architect of this vibrant scholarly uh, community, but also the movement that it represents. Uh, when Norman first proposed the Facing the Anthropocene project, I think it was about five years ago now, I confess I was one of the people who left the meeting and had to look up the term uh, Anthropocene. I think, but we were all so taken by Norman's passion, his insight, and really his overwhelming ethos of care. We knew we really had to jump on it. And five years later, I think, right, this is a generalized term that we at Duke are all talking about. Um, indeed, on Monday, I had a first year Duke student write me very insistently asking for a meeting. Uh, claiming that he was paralyzed over the current state of the planet, uh, given the magnitude of the challenges that it faced. He also knew that he couldn't act effectively and ethically without more knowledge. He wanted to know and understand himself in the context of the world. He was, and I quote, on a quest to better understand current thinking on the Anthropocene. I quickly referred him to this series, um, and uh, he has jumped right on it. I think what's interesting for me about these conversations is that they are an incredibly rare mix of that 18 year old idealism with great wisdom and world-class scholarship. Um, and so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Norman. So officially, Norman is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor of Christian Theology and Senior Fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics here at Duke University. His research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of theology, philosophy, ecology, and agrarian and environmental studies. Norman Wurzba pursues research and teaching intersections at, at this particular location. His research is centered on the recovery of the doctrine of creation and a restatement of humanity in terms of creaturely life. He is the author of way, way too many books for me to name, but you can check out his website to see them all in all their glory. He frequently lectures in Canada, the United States, and Europe. 
raised on a farm, which seems somehow unsurprising, uh, he, in Southern Alberta, no less, Norman went on to study history at the University of Lethbridge, theology at Yale University Divinity School and philosophy at Loyola University, Chicago. Since then, he has taught at St. Thomas More College, the University of Saskatchewan, Georgetown College in Kentucky, and now at Duke University Divinity School. He is the father of four children, uh, and he is married to Gretchen Seigenhals. He likes to bake, cook, and make things with wood. He enjoys playing the guitar, he enjoys being outside and spending time with his family and friends. He tries to grow some food. What these five years uh, with Norman and this project have taught me is that Norman is the kind of scholar and generous and gracious human being that truly inspires. He makes his field, Duke University and the Keenan Institute for Ethics, both wiser and more humane spaces. Thank you, Norman. My, thank you, Suzanne, that was very kind of you. So my presentation is a question and it is, can the land forgive? And I want to see how this might connect to the question of hope. When I talk to people about climate change and the multiple forms of eco-social damage that punctuate our world, I now know that I risk inducing the symptoms of what some mental health professionals are calling pre-traumatic distress syndrome. This form of PTSD happens when people are bombarded like so many concussive blows by an unrelenting stream of bad news. They recognize that multiple disasters are here and on the way, but they also feel powerless to extricate themselves from the impending doom. It is too much to bear, so they retreat, detach emotionally, and look for ways to shield themselves from yet one more catastrophe. They don't often want a detailed exposition of what is happening. They want instead to get straight to the heart of the matter. Are there grounds for hope in a world that is being steadily degraded and becoming increasingly uninhabitable? Young people routine, routinely ask me if they should still plan on having children. So how might we speak about the grounds for hope? Two principles will guide my reflection today. One is from Wendell Berry, who says that hope lives in the means, not the ends. And the second is from Kohelet, the sage of Ecclesiastes, who says, whoever is joined with all the living has hope. Together, these two principles suggest that hope resides and manifests itself in a commitment to honor and nurture life with others. It does not depend on having figured out what the future will be. Hope withers when people detach and withdraw from others, whereas hope grows when people discover and commit themselves to furthering the goodness and beauty they believe to animate this world. As researchers have considered the hopelessness that people often feel in our Anthropocene moment, they have quite rightly made grief a focal concern. The loss of life and the enormity of Earth's destruction are so great that people should feel grief. Exercising grief, however, is hard to do in cultures that are relentless in their emphasis on being positive and feeling good. Avoidance and denial have thus become key default coping strategies. But there's value in learning, as Leslie Held has suggested, to have grief as a companion. Expressing grief can help humanize the hard scientific facts that climate and earth scientists give us, and thus provide a more resonant understanding of the plight we are in. And the experience of collective grief can bring people together, make apparent their shared love and anger, and thus inspire political action. I affirm this turn to grief as a response to ecological destruction and loss. But is it not equally important to learn to confess, repent, and seek forgiveness, especially when we know that so much of the damage is anthropogenic? Ecological destruction didn't or doesn't just happen, it is the effect of social political priorities and economic practices that violate land, water, air, and fellow creatures alike. Clearly not all people are directly implicated in these practices and those that are, are not necessarily implicated in the same way or to the same degree. Even so, I think practices of confession and repentance are important in our Anthropocene time because they communicate that we take some responsibility for our roles in the wounding of our world. I don't suppose this is easy. Our culture is not good at training people 
in the arts of confession or apology. Practices like confession and repentance communicate an earnest desire to be in right or at least agreeable relationship with each other. The aim of forgiveness must not be to enable the guilty to live with impunity, since it would be a great injustice to claim that the guilty party did nothing wrong, nor should it attempt to erase or evade the wrongs that have been done to another because it is precisely the history of wrongs that needs to be kept in view so that a less violating future can be imagined. This makes forgiveness an uncommon effort. Following Paul Ricoeur, it is important to understand that both the seeking and the granting of forgiveness do not operate on a contractual level. Forgiveness cannot be negotiated or demanded. If it comes at all, it will be as a gift beyond deserving, much like the experience of unconditional love. This keeps the practices of forgiveness at the level of a desire or in the optative grammatical mood expressing a wish and a hope, if only. But a desire for what? Not for erasure or closure, not even for dissonant free harmony or wholeness. As I will argue, the desire to be forgiven is fundamentally a desire for the kind of personal and communal transformation in which people are enabled to be in supportive, ongoing relationships with others. When people lament histories of wrongdoing and then commit their efforts to being a helping and healing presence going forward, they also begin to shed the defensive or self-justifying strategies that keep them from living peaceably with the wounded. They shed the illusion that they are innocent and exempt from a need to change. Confession and repentance therefore signal the commitment to be open to and instructed by the pain and suffering of the past so that people can work together for a better future. Forgiveness creates an opening in which people can live with each other with less shame. Descriptions of forgiveness normally center on personal and social realms. These are helpful, but I don't think they go far enough. If the harms people do extend to our lands and waters, along with the many creatures that inhabit them, then we should also seek forgiveness from them. But can the land forgive? What might it look like to seek forgiveness from non-human creatures? I think the story of Don and Marie Ruzika can help. Ruzika Sunrise Farm is located north and west of Killam, Alberta, my home province, and was founded by Don's maternal grandparents in 1910. Like so many European immigrants, they had moved west in pursuit of greater opportunity and a good life. When Donna Marie bought the farm from Don's uncle in 1983, they delighted in the knowledge that they were building on a family history and commitment to this particular piece of land. But as Don recalls it, they were also excited to know that as owners, they could now realize their dreams on the land. During the 1980s, the push in agriculture from bankers, government officials, and agricultural experts was to industrialize production and maximize yield by mining the land. All across the Canadian West, wetlands and sloughs were drained, bush and woodlots cut down, and native prairie plowed up, all so that as many acres as possible could be planted in grain. Don was no different from other farmers. He grew grain and raised as many cattle as he could for the commodities markets. Every year, the pressure to increase yield in the face of dwindling profit margins mounted. To keep the farm going, operating loans had to increase at the same time. It didn't take long for an enormous debt load to accrue. The stress of it all went straight into Don's body. In March of 1986, he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. An industrial mechanized logic has no patience with personal disease. The work simply had to continue, even accelerate. So by the fall of 1995, Don and Marie could no longer avoid the question. Should they quit the farm or should they learn to farm in a different way? When Don went to pick up the mail the next day, an option was waiting for them in the form of a one-page flyer whose caption read, would you like to get off the agribusiness treadmill? It was an invitation to attend an information meeting to learn about holistic management. Don went to the meeting and discovered that holistic management is about farming in ways that restore land to health while also affording farmers and ranchers a sustainable and decent way of life. At the seminar, Don and Marie learned about ecosystem services, the value of riparian zones and native species, the dangers of pesticides and herbicides, 
and the importance of species diversity. In it, they also were beginning to understand their complicity in histories of farming wrongdoing that were systematically degrading and destroying the land. A crucial insight was dawning in their minds. As, far, far, as farmers, they do not simply live on the land, but from it and through it as members of one vast community of life. The following spring, Donna Marie saw their farm with fresh eyes. They now understood that they were going to have to repent and change their lives. The patterns of their daily work, the range of their affections and sympathies, the metrics that measured success and failure, even what they imagined a good human life to be, all of these needed to change if they were going to farm in this new way. And it was not going to be easy. 12 years of industrial methods had to be unlearned and the pressure of banks and neighbors to continue in well-established and officially sanctioned ways, these had to be resisted. There was also an enormous risk. The farm, a family history, a way of knowing and feeling and working, all were on the line. The following year, 1997, Don and Marie sold all of their grain equipment and 320 acres of cultivated land. The 600 remaining acres of cultivated land were converted to pasture and 200 acres to native prairie, wetlands, and woods. A system of rotational grazing was put in place for the broilers, turkeys, laying hens, and hogs that were now a base of the farm operation, and cattle would be regularly moved through fenced-in paddocks so as not to overgraze pasture land or contaminate riparian zones. The method moving forward was going to be organic. The goal was to restore the land to vitality and health by giving it regular times to rest and replenish. By May of 1999, Don and Marie had paid down all of their debt. As Don puts it, I'm unable to clearly explain and do justice to how this removal of debt affected me. I felt as though I had been held hostage by the banking system, and now I was free. The freedom Don now felt was wholly unlike the freedom he felt upon first purchasing the farm. In 1983, it was a freedom to do with the land whatever he wanted, a freedom to work out his dreams of personal and family success by making the land produce. But in 1999, it was a freedom to serve the land and to nurture it to health, a freedom to give himself to the land in practices of work that facilitate multi-species flourishing. To realize this new form of freedom, Don knew he was going to need a lot of help. Much of it came in the form of teachers biologists, riparian and agroforestry specialists, ornithologists, entomologists, ecologists, and range and wetland specialists. They helped him understand the damage that industrial methods had done to the land, and they showed him a better way. What followed was a complex, intensive management program that prioritized the protection of riparian zones, the replanting of roughly 100,000 trees, the reintroduction of native grasses and pollinator-friendly plants, and the creation of habitat for diverse wildlife species, all while raising domestic livestock in a humane and species honoring manner. Now, Don traces his experience of being forgiven by the land to May 21st, 2000 at approximately 6 a.m. He was out in a pasture moving his chicken shelters to fresh grass when he heard the unmistakable song of a Western meadowlark. Don considers this bird song to be amongst the most beautiful sounds on the prairie. He had not heard it since the spring of 1989, when for some reason the birds stopped showing up at his farm. He missed their presence and their song terribly. And now here it was. As Don remembers it, the first song made him stand up. Could it be that the meadow larks had returned? But the second song hit him like a trumpet blast. It reverberated through his body and sent him to the ground. In its song, he heard the land say, I forgive you. In our conversation, Don speaks to how this experience happened as part of a journey of personal transformation. He doesn't claim to comprehend all of it, but what he recognizes is that his commitment to stop mining and abusing the land went hand in hand with the growing appreciation for the land and its creatures as kin. Over time, and with much newfound attention and effort, Don came into the presence of what he calls the spirit of the land, the sense that the land isn't simply a piece of private property, but a being with integrity and sanctity. It could be harmed and violated, and it had a moral, even personal claim upon his life. 
insofar as Don was committed, like fellow farmers, to making the land pay, the land was mute and reduced to a commodifiable object that had lost any spiritual or moral resonance. To hear the voice of the land is not required that one be a mystic. As Don describes it, he needed to slow down so he could meditate on the life moving around him. The crucial effort was to shift from making his life an imposition on the land to making his life a conversation and a joining with the land. In effect, what Don needed to do is dedicate himself to the land's flourishing and thereby rethink all his work as a form of husbandry a difficult matrimony that must continually work out the demands of fidelity in context of ignorance and surprise, but also negligence and hurt. Over months and years, Don and Marie were developing new habits of work that enabled resonance and fidelity with their land. One way to characterize these new habits is to note how Don and Marie transformed their work into a complex set of practices that communicate hospitality. Industrial methods of farming that mine and exploit the land are fundamentally inhospitable because they push native plant and animal species out. Their homes are destroyed or poisoned, so they either die or go away. But as Don and Marie eliminated the use of poisons, repaired their water systems, replanted native grasses, flowers, bushes, and trees, they also created a welcoming, hospitable habitat for microbes and insects, bees and butterflies, birds, and all these different mammals to come back. Along with the meadowlarks that sent Don to the ground, swains and hawks, sprague's pipit, pileated woodpeckers, kingfishers, beavers, badgers, deer, moose, to name a few, have all returned to the farm. Their growing presence and population are the material evidence that the Rosicas have made their farm a welcoming, nurturing, hospitable place a place where a multitude of creatures can feed, reproduce, and thrive. We can interpret the meadowlark song as the bird's declaration of forgiveness because it communicates that it welcomes Dawn's wealth and that it does not see Dawn's presence as a threat and that it is prepared to carry on its life with his. That so many creatures are now content to live in Don's presence and on his land is a clear communication that Don is doing rightly with his fellow creatures, or that he is at least on the right track of action, and that he need not let a history of shame prevent him from continuing in this new way of farming. In this listening, Don has heard that the land not only forgives him, it also loves him by providing for his needs. The land does not simply belong to him, he belongs to it is accepted by it as one who grows out of the ground and is nurtured by its life. Don and Marie teach us that hope grows as people are deeply connected to and live in right relationship with the land and its creatures. This hope is not sentimental or romantic because it is framed by the memory of so many wounds. The experience of it was prepared by Don learning to slow down and humbly open himself to and express gratitude for the sanctity of life going on around him. He needed to confess when he saw that his action precipitated harm, and he needed to repent by learning the science that informs the hard work of restoring riparian zones and reintroducing native species. Don describes his recent efforts to reintroduce native grass and tree species as making reparation for his sins. He says, I may never create the habitat required for the shark tails to return, but hopefully other species will appear, and they have. Again, forgiveness is evolving by doing the best I can to make things right with the land. He proposes that we may need a new organization called Ecological Sinners Anonymous, where people can tell their stories of mistakes made, but also of the repair work attempted, so that solutions for healing and right living can be shared with as many people as possible. The time is overdue, Don thinks, for those embroiled within the ways of industrial agriculture to engage in practices of confession. To conclude, people who live in hope believe that being joined to others is not only a necessity, but a fundamental good. There is no hope being alone in a mute commodified world. There is no hope in an unsympathetic existence. A hopeful life is founded upon resonant relationships in which confession and care and repentance and a commitment to healing are primary practices. 
If hope presupposes an abiding affirmation of the goodness of this world and its life and manifests itself practically in a dedication to join with all the living in the work of nurture and respect, then it is clear that the damaging and the breaking of relationships that punctuate so many of our histories must be noted, confessed, lamented, and repented. Insofar as people want, as the author Linda Hogan suggests, a healing, a cure for anguish, and a remedy that will heal the wound between us and the world that contains our broken histories, then grief over the pain and loss people cause is not enough. They should also seek forgiveness because the desire for forgiveness registers as the commitment to be in life-affirming relationship with others. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that, Norman. I think you've set really a tremendous table for a conversation. Um, I'm, I'm truly struck by this set of relationships that you've outlined, um, starting again with a new term for me, pre-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, but your turn to hope um, as actionable um, and rooted in um, both repentance and forgiveness, I think is an extraordinary one. Um, I think both as we think about the Anthropocene, but as we think about our human relations more generally, um, historically, um, nationally at this moment, I, th I think you're offering something much, much broader. Uh, but let's turn a little bit to the specific case of the Anthropocene and this really lovely story of, of Donna Marie's experience. Um, the way that they had this rapprochement with the land um, and the coming together of it as, as really a process over time, I, I think is teaching us something very important. I guess that the question I have, you know, sitting from my office on Duke's East Campus um, where I walk the 200 yards from my house, um, I, I don't sense a relationship with the land, nor do I sense um, in my daily life a relationship with the land. Um, and how does one like me um, have that rapprochement with the land to begin to um, take responsibility and accountability um, for my role in, in the planetary crisis of the moment. Yeah, that's, that's um, a how great do question. Pivot from a person deeply engaged in the land to lots of people like me who have grown up and exist in deliberative separation from the land in many ways. Yeah. No, that's a really important question, Suzanne. I, and I, I think the first thing I would say is we need to acknowledge the kind of insularity from land that so many people experience. And you know, part of that is a feature of our built environments where we live in buildings, in climate controlled cars, and you know, we barely have the time or make the time to actually notice the land upon which we do our day-to-day -day activities. And then if we do, for a lot of people, land is basically stage or backdrop for the important stuff that humans do. And so land doesn't even feature as a primary actor or as a very important actor in our day-to-day -day living. And I think, you know, of course, being in the educational world, we'll say that education is very important. And it is because our embodied life requires us to be attached to the land. And we confirm it every time that we eat any food. So one of the things that's required is that I think that people need to rediscover how their body attaches them to land. And I think one of the ways to, that, to make that real is you know, I encourage people to try to grow something. And, and that's not a small task. I don't, I don't advise them to grow all their food. It's an enormous task to try to do that. But if people try to just grow one plant and discover the kind of attention it takes, that's important. Um, because then you learn about how easy it is to be negligent or to abandon or to be ignorant or to be impatient and you know all these virtues or vices that people 
have trouble with, uh, I think these are things worth considering. I think another thing that, that merits saying is that we don't need to think about land in terms of wilderness or farmland even. We can think about our neighborhoods. So Duke as a campus sits in Durham, North Carolina. Has Duke or the people of Duke, have we spent much time understanding our neighborhoods, our region, our city? And, and by that, I mean, do we understand the history? Because people living in a community or a neighborhood flourish better when the neighborhood is flourishing. And I think this again is a feature of built environments where people often, you know, they drive their cars, they park in their garages, they have their privacy fences, and there's almost no engagement with even the people on their street. And so part of the effort of, of being in a, a better relationship with land is to actually have a relationship. Stop seeing it just as backdrop or staging for what we do and see how our neighborhoods, our cities, our farms, you know, our watersheds, how they actually flow into our lives. Because from a, just a physiological point of view, that's a fact. So um, I want you to flesh this out just, just a bit more as I think about your, the way you defined hope as relational and flourishing in the interstices of relationships, whether that's with the land or other humans. Um, so as, as a person who lives in a fairly built up environment um, with neighbors, is what's the relationship between those human relationships and the relationship with the land? And how do we bring those together effectively from your perspective? Yeah, that's a really good question too. I think. I think one thing that we do in our relationships with people is we open ourselves up to another person's world and experience. And you know, the depth of relationship takes time. Okay? We need to, to learn the stories of how each of us came to be. And I think what happens is, is when, you, when you start to talk with people, you discover that the places in which they grew up, the places that nurtured them, pretty clearly have a role for them or the loss of any attachment also is playing a role. And an author that I really love uh, is Robin Kimmerer. And she, she talks about how the experience of alienation that people have from the land, right? That they just don't feel a connection to it creates a kind of psychic disturbance because I think people can relate to the idea that if they grew up not loved by others, whether it's parents or family members or community or whatever, that they will develop all sorts of compensatory strategies to try to show that they matter. And I think what Robin's point is that when people don't feel that they are in a life-giving relationship with land, they also will have a kind of psychic disturbance going on because they don't feel they belong. And, and so the question of identity is so closely bound up with the question of belonging. And, and I wanna suggest that that happens on these two levels. There's a social kind of belonging that people I think feel the need for, but I think we're also seeing in this Anthropocene moment that people also want a biophysical sense of belonging, right? a place belonging, because we're becoming so aware that the places, right, the oceans, the watersheds, the forests, the soil, I mean, you name it, all of the, the ecosystems that we could list, we know that they're in trouble. And we know they're in trouble because of human activity. Not everybody's implicated, obviously, or implicated in the same way, but we're sensing that the land that we live through is, is being distorted and de degraded and even destroyed. And, and that creates some real, I think, psychic, trouble for people. And so one of the things that, that I try to figure out with people is, is how do we create a sense that we belong to the land and not just that land belongs to us. And, and usually that takes the form of some kind of work of you know, repair or nurture. Um, so I like that notion of repair and nurture. And I think it's one of the things that the story of Don and Marie is so evocative about and how the repair of land was restorative for his physical and psychic health, health and how they come um, together so importantly. One of the terms that you um, mentioned just as you're talking just now is love. Could you talk a little bit more about how love fits into um, 
this framework that you've described? Um, and can we have hope without love? Um, and so and is, is it love for the land the same as that moment of repentance and forgiveness, or is it something else? Yeah. So yeah, love is, is central. But I, I want to also quickly say that you want to risk, or not risk, getting sentimental about what we mean by this love. Because love is hard, okay? So just thinking on the level of friendship or family, you commit to loving somebody and you know they're going to break your heart, right? <laughs> or you, they're going to piss you off, or they're going to do something that you really wish they didn't. And, and what love requires then is that you stay and you commit to, to being open, being around, and being willing to help. And, and, and love constantly requires you to ask for forgiveness because even when I think I'm trying to be loving to another, I might be doing something that actually harms them in my name of doing something loving for them. So love is, is a disposition that is genuinely trying to be open to others so as to come alongside them in ways that are helpful and at their best, even celebratory, you might say. But we know that this is always a fraught activity because our motives are not always pure, right? We can use love not in an unconditional way, but with all kinds of conditions, right? When we say, I will love you if you do this or that. And, and I think what, what I've learned over the years is that it's either the degradation of love or the absence of love that is the source of so much of our trouble. Right? If people genuinely understood how they are loved, how they are of value, that would open up life in a new sort of way. And so if we bring it back to the story of, of Sunrise Farm and, and Don Marie's case, they for so long lived on the land not knowing that the land loved them. And, and that made possible a rather aggressive, impositional way of relating to the land. But when they came to what Don calls the spirit of the land, and he learned this from his First Nations friends that he was engaging at about the same time, that he began to see the land as part of a kinship circle in which all sorts of creatures, human creatures, non-human creatures, plant creatures, even what we might call just landscapes, were places that, that create the possibility for shared life and for flourishing he came to a completely new understanding of his belonging to land that cared for him. If he cared for it too, right, that there could be an opening for a kind of psychic ease. And Don will even say a kind of psychic joy because now when he goes out, he goes into the midst of all these animals that are loving their life. And he says to have had a hand in that. I mean, he doesn't control it, he knows that but that he's not as much of an obtrusive presence is, is so rewarding. And I think this is an experience that so many people want, whether on the social level or on the sort of place level, is to know that their presence is a good presence and not a violating presence. Yeah, I, I lo love how you, I love how you've described love there in terms of this notion of commitment and then connected it to a way of being in relationship to the land that it, that seems really central to what you're describing here. Um, you know, how do we think about, you know, sort of, at one point you talk about sort of ecological sinners anonymous. Um, and, you know, sort of for individuals, like what is the, you know, sort of acknowledgement of the Right, the fractured relationship is central. Um, uh, a request for forgiveness is is imperative. How how do we do that? You know, sort of as individuals, but also as communities. So as we think about the Duke community and Duke's relationship to the land, um, how do we begin to take steps toward that? Um, sort of act of acknowledgement and, and re request for forgiveness. Yeah. It's not easy because, I mean, think about how hard it is to train children to ask for forgiveness or to even say they're sorry. We don't want to think that we do wrong. And so 
I, I, I think that the best way into this is to be in conversation with a diversity of people, people who you trust and people who you know will be prepared to speak things to you even when they're painful. And, you know, in, in my own case, but also in the case of people that I know, that means talking with people you might not normally talk to, right? So if you think about Durham, right, what are the neighborhoods that have been impacted by Duke but Duke has never acknowledged, let alone spoken to, to say, how have we harmed you, right? What has been our role in the construction of a Durham that does you pain? That is a very, very difficult conversation to have. And so I don't think this is easy at all. I don't think it's a place that a lot of us will go to willingly. And, you know, I, I think again about Don and Marie, I mean, this is what I said, that a family history was on the line. He had to come to the realization that decades of family pride were actually decades of family hubris that was deeply destructive of land and the ecosystem. And you can imagine what this does to family dynamics. It's, it's really difficult to admit your own wrongdoing. And sometimes you need to be in a place where you've got a community that is prepared to say to you the hard truth you don't want to hear, but also a community that says, we're not going to abandon you when you get blasted with the knowledge of all that you've done that's harmful. And so there's a real communal dimension to these practices of repentance and confession. And then also the seeking of forgiveness. And as I said, it, it's, you don't have a guarantee you're going to be forgiven. They may just remain angry with you and want nothing to do with you. But the effort to confess, the effort to want to do rightly is so important because apart from that effort, we're just going to continue to do the duty of this world and its life. You can't, you can't rest content with the continuation of harm. So as, as I think about what you're describing in the context of community and say a relationship between Duke and Durham, it strikes me that there's an extraordinary first move which is really about this, this you know, sort of childhood notion of saying, I'm sorry, um, and not how do I fix it? Uh, not here's what I can do for you, but I'm sorry. And I, I wanna hear your perspective and I wanna listen first um, before I fix or offer to change. Um, and, and that seems to be so critical to what Don and Marie also did, right? Yeah. That it wasn't um, a jump into the organic trend. It, it was sitting with the hubris of their history and acknowledging yeah. it and asking um, for forgiveness and demonstrating commitment to being and doing differently yeah. in, in an ongoing relationship. And, that seems right, both in terms of thinking about our relationship to the land, but also our relationships in general. Um, that um, in, in the same way we have romanticized notions of love, we have romanticized notions of, right, so sorry, right, here to help, I, right, and move on. But this really methodical effort at repentance seems to be where, um, there's that restorative moment with the land and really for them, right? That his health is restored, his psychic well-being, it, right, it is different. He sees life in a new way and, and that's derived from that repentance. Yeah, um, I, I mean, you put that really well, Suzanne. And, and when you talk to Don, even now, he, he will say that he's, he's no expert at this. There are relationships that are, are much, much better. Some are really good. Some have just become more difficult because his way of farming is a kind of physical rebuke to farmers who are neighbors who have no interest in going down this path with him. So forgiveness is, does not result in a kind of, you know, we're all gonna do a big group hug. Uh, it doesn't often work out that way. And I think another point that you made that is, is so important is, that the struggle of, of learning how to repent is an undoing of yourself. 
Because if you just come in and say, I'm sorry, and then you think we'll just go on again, nothing about your life has changed. But genuine repentance presupposes a kind of openness that your life is going to be changed dramatically and you don't get to be the boss of it. And that's really unsettling, which is why it's so important that the efforts of confession and repentance and lament and forgiveness happen within what we might call a context in which there's a commitment to love so that people, like I said, you get blasted with hearing all the bad things you have been doing and are still doing that you don't just, you know, get into the fetal position and cry yourself to sleep every day because that's a possibility and that does not create the kind of relationship that enables people to go into a future knowing that, yeah, they, they've done a lot wrong, but they can still do some good, which is, I think, something people really want to know they can still do. Yeah, and I think gives us a really um, compelling pathway between the pre-traumatic stress, the grief, and that transition to hope. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to transition now to the many questions that are queuing up from the audience. Um, so let me just begin here. Um, what does Don and Marie's story have to say to the suburban homeowner and urban renter? In those contexts, how does one recognize the claim upon the land that it has upon themselves and the relationship and spirit of the land? And I think you've yeah. addressed some of this, but... Yeah, it's a great question. And it's also a difficult one because, you know, suburban places are often characterized by geographers as, as the sort of epitome of placelessness, right? This tract housing, it's all uniform. There's no real indication about the history of the land or how the topography or the geography even has any bearing on what's happening in the suburbs. So I think, I think one thing that suburbanites might want to do is just try to understand a bit about suburbia what is it what is it as a phenomenon what is it trying to achieve and then to think more carefully about the land where their suburban tract is right what's the history of this suburb coming to be what was happening beforehand and then start to educate each other about how can you sort of transform a suburb so that the history of the place comes to view and that people can still work to try to achieve some some good in this place and you know, an example of this that I can think of in the several, I suppose, but what if you decide that you're going to transform your suburb? Maybe you're a neighborhood association and you're going to say, we're going to create green space. We're going to create educational programs. We're going to grow some food in our neighborhood. We're going to involve kids to teach them about, you know, where carrots come from. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can regrow, relearn attachments to the land and to the history of a place because a place isn't simply a location. A place is also always the history of that place coming to be what it is now. Um, so learning some history is really important. Um, you know, urban renters, you know, this, this too, I mean, this, this, this can be a really difficult question, but it, it again, I think requires some attention to the history of how this place came to be. And the, the histories obviously have shared, you know, trajectories, but also some divergences. And so thinking about how even in dense urban spaces, we can find ways to reconnect with neighborhoods, with neighbors, how we can convert what is often abandoned or unused spaces to create life-giving opportunities. It doesn't always have to be food. It can be about developing co-ops around you know, shared life, right? So you hear about how children, right? Parents have to work and they don't know what to do with their kids. Can you form co-ops to get to know each other's families better, where people are coming from and learn to look out for each other, right? It's, it's not always about soil, right? It's also about creating garden communities that consist of people uh, who are being well nurtured and cared for. And, and to do that, you have to learn to come into the presence of each other. And that's something that you can do wherever you are, even if it's in a high rise apartment. Yeah, I think it's a it, this notion of bringing back relationships and history is really the antidote to the sanitization that the suburban movement represented, right? Yeah. It was an effort to kind of remove the messiness of human relations and of relations with the land really deliberatively. So yeah. how do we bring that back in? I think is is really important. Next yeah. one is from David Liu. Um, the economy of repentance, forgiveness, hope that you outline and narrate 
as an anthropo as an anthropoc uh, is is one well nested in Christian theology. My apologies, David. Uh, how do you translate that discourse into larger society? Um, right? How do you think about this? in the context of other traditions and ethical frameworks that don't really speak these Christian words in the same way. Yeah. Well, I think first I would say they're not exclusively Christian terms, right? Other traditions do also speak about apology, confession, lament. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily tied to this way of speaking. In fact, um, Donna Marie are, are Catholic, but what they discovered is that their Catholic church did very little to help them, in fact, could be an obstacle. So much of what Donna Marie were doing came as a result of their talk with community members and especially with First Nations peoples, right? So indigenous folks have ways about talking around these kinds of issues. And so the experience of doing harm or doing wrong and seeking to repair in the context or to heal in the context of that wrong, I don't see that that is tied to any one particular faith or religious tradition. And, and of course, there will be different ways to narrate what we're doing, and there will be different sort of archetypical you know, stories that we might draw on, and, and I, I don't see how it needs to be tied to one tradition. So I, I encourage people to think of, about wherever they are with whomever they are with, um, what would be their ways of speaking to this question? How do we make right a wrong, or at least try to make right a wrong? Because that's the fundamental move here. How can we live in the presence of each other and in the presence of our places without shame or with less shame, assuming that you can't ever be completely without shame. Wonderful. Um, the next question uh, is about a book that is about to come out uh, by a psychologist at Yale, Frank Keel. He's written a book on wonder. He speaks about the beautiful sense of wonder and inquisitiveness children have and how it gets extinguished quickly. Um, what role do you suppose wonder might play in what you're suggesting? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's sort of at the fundamental level of what starts all of this. And, and that level is, are we amazed by the goodness and beauty of this world? If, if you don't start with that kind of experience, I think it's gonna be difficult, right? I, I, I want to, this brings us back to what we were talking about earlier about love. Do we see fellow human beings, do we see fellow creatures, do we see places as, as expressions of something that is fundamentally good, the manifestations of something that's fundamentally beautiful, call it life, call it the sacred, there's different ways that we can talk about this. But unless we start with something like an affirmation of this world, I don't see how you're gonna get very far toward this effort of trying to repair our broken relationships in the world, right? If you just think, it's a dustbin, or if you think it's just a, you know, a lump of mess or just a big cosmic accident, the inducement to want to live rightly with it or with each other has, has been eroded pretty significantly. So, so wonder, I think, is a good way to talk about this experience we, we start with, which is to say, being in a place, being in this world, being with others, being with you, it's just wonderful. Great. Um, so how do we think about the notion of representation, re forgiveness? Is it possible or even desirable for other human beings of goodwill to ask for forgiveness for the wrongs and wounds dealt by others? Wow, that's hard. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, there's several dimensions to the question that I want to bring up, and I don't have time to do all of them, but so I'll just start with one. I think one, one way we need to start is to recognize that individuals are not individuals, right? That we're always implicated in a history and we're always connected. So for instance, I, I'm a Canadian, I'm living in America, but I'm benefiting from all sorts of histories of American development that I find deeply troubling some of which are not deeply troubling. And I'm implicated simply by living here 
So does that mean I have some role in what has happened in America 100 years ago or 200 years ago? I suppose so. I don't know exactly, but because I am a beneficiary of a history or someone who is suffering because of that history, I do have something that can contribute to the healing of wrongs committed by others. I guess I wanna get away from this notion that every wrong has one clear agent and one clear effect. And it's not that simple because we're all implicated in systems and processes that reach out into communities and places and histories over which we have no control, but yet we still have some obligation, I think, to it. And you know, what's at work in this question, the, the big philosophical question for me at least, is what is the role of history in the formation of our future life? Right. There are plenty of folks who want to say, let's just forget the history. Let's forget that slavery happened. We're all we're past that now. And, and the simple answer is we cannot just assume that slavery is over because if we think about African-American farmers today, they are dispossessed from land in, in ways that are so clearly discriminatory and racist. And so that means for me that there's some obligation to try to work for land reparations. Right now, I was not a slaveholder. I was not even in this country. But living here, teaching at Duke, I still have some responsibility for this. And so, being able to clearly put the markers of where responsibility begins and where it ends, that's not something I can decide. It's fluid. Sometimes other people are going to come to me and say, You're implicated. You didn't think you were, but you are. And sometimes that's really hard to hear. But again, what this does, I think, is it helps us see how much this process of confession and repentance happens in communal spaces where we're constantly having to learn our role, not just our role in the past, but also the role we might have going forward. Great. One last question. Can you speak a bit about the difference between hope and optimism? Optimism seems probabilistic, a sense of knowing how things will likely unfold whereas hope highlights the possible, what might be. I wonder about the psychology of hope versus optimism and the relationship to action. In Wendell Berry's terms, might hope be focused on the means and optimism on the ends? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. And, and yeah, I think one of the key distinguishing features is that you know, optimism has this assumption that things are all going to work out just fine. And it makes you somewhat passive as a person because things, however we characterize those things, are going to work out just fine. And, and I think that's an abdication of responsibility. And it's also, I think, a kind of hubris because we don't know how things are going to turn out in the end, uh, whatever we mean by the end. Um, what we do know right now is that earth system scientists and ecologists and environmental historians, I mean, all sorts of people are telling us that the, the trajectory that we're on is leading us into some pretty, pretty awful places. But again, we can't predict exactly how these things are going to play. And so I say, take the pressure off yourself about knowing the end, take the hubris away in claiming that I don't have to do anything and decide how is love gonna motivate your life? Because the commitment to be in right relationship with others, with communities, with neighborhoods, with places is driven by love. And that is what gives you the hope, right? I don't think that hope requires us to know how things are gonna turn out at all. So hope is not something you so much have as hope is something more like what you do. And hope is that sort of action in which you manifest your love. And I think all of us would agree that the world would be better if we were living in the presence of people who were motivated by love and were embodying love. I think that would be, that'd be a life changer and maybe even a world changer. An extraordinary way to end the conversation and, and thinking about hope as a action or love in action. And I think that's an extraordinary thought to leave us with. Uh, but because this is the final minute of this extraordinary series of conversations, I wanted to leave it to you for any final reflections on your work with the group, 
um, things that you are hopeful about moving forward? Yeah. Well, I, I think this webinar series has just been wonderful and it's part of a larger grant that's been funded by the Henry Luce Foundation. And so, first of all, a lot of gratitude needs to be expressed to the foundation and, and to you, Suzanne, for the Keenan Institute for Ethics for supporting this work. And I think what's just been so wonderful about this Anthropocene project is that it enabled a good number of people from the senior working members who were part of the series, but also graduate students and colleagues who were introduced to questions. And this was really a project motivated by questions much more than by solutions. Because we're, we, we started with the assumption, Jed Purdy was sort of my co-conspirator in the beginning of this, in which we said, we may not even know what the right questions are because it seems that so many of the assumptions that have brought us to this moment of, of so much pain and destruction and suffering that we're not gonna be able to use those frameworks to get us to a better way. And so having conversation and working together with a diverse set of people who all have their own interests and backgrounds and training has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever been able to do. So I'm immensely grateful to, to my colleagues in the webinar series, to my colleagues at Duke, the graduate students who participated and to the crew behind the scenes, Brett Stone, Cypher, Avery Davis, Lamb, and Amy Peterson and Mari Yorstadt who worked on this project with me. So it's been great to have you as part of the journey. And I wanna sign off by saying, thanks so much for being a part of this. Wonderful. And with that, thank you. <laughs>